Well, hey, everybody. Good to see all of you here today. Welcome to Community Church. Hey, we're kicking off a brand uh, new series today called Move. Everybody say Move. All right, not bad. 1230, love you guys. Um, we, uh, I don't know about you, my, my wife and I, we were thinking about upgrading our, our cell phones. Anybody got a cell phone? Anybody got it? Anybody like an upgrade, right? You know, nothing like a really good upgrade. And I don't know, I have this, I have this um, uh, love-hate relationship with my phone. Does anybody else have a love-hate relationship with their phone? Because like, there's things about it I love. Uh, I love to be able to connect with people. I love to uh, uh, text my wife all these, uh, you know, funny emojis and stuff, you know, and that's none of your business. But um, I like to uh, I take pictures of my kids and post them on social media, Instagram, and just brag on them. I'm so proud of them. I love to, um, I get all my news. I just read, read the news here on my phone, read the paper uh, every day on my phone. Uh, I even watch TV now on my phone. I cut the cord of cable. I no longer have cable. And um, yeah, that's right. Hey, save yourself some money. You can cut off cable. And now I watch everything on my phone. I cast it to my TV at home. And I use YouTube TV. Anybody use YouTube? Okay, a couple of you. It's like 40 bucks a month. I'm, gonna, I'm saving you 100 bucks a month. Get off cable. Go YouTube TV. Chromecast it. And it's awesome. And even, even if I'm not at home, wherever I am, I can always, you know, uh, you know catch the news or whatever I want. And I, I, I do really important things on my phone. Um, I play words with friends with my mother every day. And uh, she's, she's, she is ruthless. She's brutal. She beats me like nine out of ten times. And, uh, but that's a lot of fun. And so I, there's so much. I, I, I don't, can't remember the last time I actually bought something in the store because uh, I buy almost everything uh, on Amazon now and just whoosh, swipe right. It's awesome. It's in my house in like two days. Uh, so uh, I just, there's, there's just so much I love about my phone, but there's some things that, you know, I, I hate too. Like for me, a, a phone can really be a, um, like a constant interruption. Anybody know? Like I'm trying to text, uh, I'm trying to preach right now. I'm getting texts about phones. My mother's talking to me and she's like, I'm gonna clean the floor with you on Words with Friends. <laughs> and and uh, so it can be a, a, oftentimes a, an interruption. Um, and, uh, you know, as a pastor uh, also, you know, I'm on call like 24 seven. And a lot of times when my phone rings, it's not usually like, hey, pastor, you know, God put on my heart to give the church a million bucks. No, it's not usually that. Like, I don't usually get that kind of phone call. Uh, it's usually uh, in the last two days, uh, I got a phone call um, uh, two days ago. Uh, and he calls me and he says, pastor, I need to talk. You got a few, sure. And my marriage is falling apart. Another guy calls me, pastor, um, I'm hurting. My relationship with my wife, totally different, another story. And I get another call. Um, my, uh, my son made a really bad mistake. Could you go visit him at the correctional facility? Uh, somebody's sick. Somebody, it's usually, you know, we get these phone calls. And, and so I just never know what's going to happen when, like, when, my, when my phone rings. So I have this kind of love-hate relationship. But you think of all the things that we do now, uh, like with technology, it's, it's mind-boggling. When after all, like what this was originally intended for and still its primary use today uh, is to simply make and receive calls, right? Uh, just to connect with a call. Uh, this technology originally was invented uh, uh, by the Scottish uh, immigrant Alexander Graham Bell. You remember that? And he, uh, he invented this ability for two people who are separated by a long distance to make a long distance phone call, right? To connect with one another and, and to be able to have a conversation. One of those early phones, um, it looked like this. Um, now, if anybody ever used one of these, um, dude, you're seriously old. I know my wife, <laughs> I'm sorry, I know my daughter called you old last week if you were over 40, but if you've used one of these phones, you're like seriously old. And then the technology kind of changed and it, it went from being on the wall to kind of on your desk and there was a, a, a receiver and a transmitter and you could kind of hold it and it's kind of old timey phone. And then we jumped leaps and bounds in technology when this guy came out. How many remember this phone? Seriously. Come on. You guys remember this phone? Some of you? Now for some of you younger people, all right, like when you wanted to make a phone call with this, you had to take your finger and you had to put it in the hole 
and it's rotated around. That's why it's called a rotary phone. And if somebody had like a, a number that was like 888, you know, six, it would take forever, you know, for them because you'd have to wait for it to come back. And yeah, that was the old time, like rotary phones. And then back in the 70s, if you remember, they came in all these like psychedelic colors, right? It was, you know, you had them all over your house, different colors. And then this guy came out. Come on, how many had one of these hanging on their wall? Come on, in their kitchen? You guys remember this phone? And this was like brand new technology. No longer is it a rotary phone where you had to wait and it took forever to make the phone call. But this was a push dial phone. You just push the dial and it would dial, push the button and it would dial the number for you. And remember you had this on the, on the wall and, and, and then you had the really long cord so you could like walk all over and then you get like really into a conversation, right? And then you're all twisted up in the cord. You guys remember that? And you can't, and once that cord gets twisted, there's no way, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. There was no way to, it just, it just hung twisted this whole, its whole life. That was the, 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 the uh, phone. And then I tell you, light years ahead in advance, this was one of the very first cell phones. This cell phone weighed two and a half pounds. We measure these in ounces. The original cell phones were two and a half pounds, but that wasn't with the battery. The battery was, in, you had to carry in a big like backpack that you put over, and the battery weighed like 15 pounds. How many remember that? You put it like your center console. You guys remember these, these old cell phones? And then they started getting better, making them smaller. That was the old Nokia phone. You guys remember that one? Then, then um, this was a big change, the flip phone. Dude, how many had a flip all right. I said that last service. I'm like, the dude still has this phone. And he, he literally has this phone, the same phone. I actually had this phone 15 years ago when we started the church. It was my first flip phone. You, you flipped it up and dial had all these cool, put like little uh, JPEG images on the front. But these phones were indestructible. And they're really thin, but they carried a good battery life. And I remember when we first started the church, we were portable. So we would everything we do to have church, it was all packed up into a trailer, and then we did, and we ended up with multiple trailers as the church grew, and we'd have to, you know, put everything, lights, and the screens, and instruments, and cribs for kids, and the toys, and everything it takes to have church, uh, that we still do today. We had it all packed up in cases, and we'd take it to the school, we used to meet up at West High School, and we'd unpack it, have church, pack it back up, put it in trailers, and early in those days, I used to drive one of the, the trucks with a trailer, and um, I was... I was dropping the trailer off after church one Sunday uh, afternoon. It was pouring down rain. And uh, we had this place where we'd park it, the, the trailer, at one of the guys in our church. He had this uh, house over here by Santa Fe. And we went back in there. And he had this, like, it was, I kid you not, like four or 500 foot long driveway, straight driveway. And I used to try to back this thing up. I'm not even good just backing like a regular car up, let alone with a 20-foot trailer on it, right? I could never get my CDL just for this reason alone. Dude, he used to come home from church. He'd sit on his front porch with a glass of iced tea, and he'd just wait for the show to start when I would come to try to back. It took me a half hour, all in his grass and tour. Anyway, uh, I, so I dropped the trailer off, and my phone fell out of my pocket, and it, and it was pouring down rain. I didn't realize it. I can't find my phone anywhere for a whole week. It rained that whole week. I go back the next week, pick up the trailer. There, right in the grass, is laying my phone. I took that home. I didn't even pack it in rice. I didn't even know that. This was like before you even knew that. You know, I just plugged this thing, sucker lit right up, and she worked great for like another six months until this came out. And anybody have one of these? You remember what these are? Blackberry, right? We used to call them crackberries because everybody's, this is when texting really became a thing with the Blackberry. Everybody's texting and getting carpal tunnel syndrome. It was awful, right? Walking around, all these things on. And then we got to the more modern cell phones that we know today. Here's the iPhone 10. And, and I was going to go for the upgrade, but uh, Pastor Chris is like, oh, wait, Pastor, don't go. In September, they're coming out with a brand new upgrade, so I got I to gotta wait for my upgrade. And so maybe you have like an, an iPhone or some form of lesser technology, like, I don't know, like a Nokia Note or so. I don't know what you got. But uh, that was a joke. You can laugh. It's okay. You're in church. I'm kind of a, a Mac, you know, uh, uh, I'm a Mac guy, all right? I'm a Mac guy. But um, the interesting thing about the phone is that it was originally designed to help us connect with a call. 
And today as we kick off this brand new series, I want to help you connect with the greatest call you could ever receive in your life. And that's the calling of God on your life. And I'm firmly convinced that every single person in this room and watching today online, that God has a specific and a unique and a special an extraordinary call on your life. And if you'll let me, for the next few minutes, I'd like to unpack what that really looks like. For some of you, that's the first time you've heard it. For others, you've been walking in that calling for a long time. In fact, I believe that everybody that is part of Community Church, uh, we're all on a spiritual journey. Some of us are just kind of kicking the tires on the whole church thing and trying to figure it out. Others of us, we've been walking with God and living out our calling for a really long time, living a fully surrendered life. And wherever you are on that spiritual continuum, we're just glad that you're here. But we also believe that wherever you are, every single one of us has a next step to take so that we can walk and fulfill the calling of God on our life. And I'd like to help you understand what that really looks like in a very practical way in your own life. I want to kick it off with Romans chapter 8. It's a very familiar verse. It says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good. Isn't that good? Can we just, can we just thank God that we serve a God who works? He works for the good in our life, and it, that no matter what's going on, we can know that God, that God isn't lazy. He isn't disconnected. It, it, it's not like he doesn't care about what's going on in your life and in my life. No, we serve a God who works for the good. He doesn't work for the bad. Aren't you thankful? Come on, God works for the good. We ought to praise him. We ought to give him thanks today that he's working for the good in my life. Now, a lot of people get confused when, when, they, when they read this. I, I want to make sure I'm very clear. It doesn't say that, it, it, that, that all things are good. No, it says that in all things God works for the good. Huge difference. Everything in this world is not good. Everything that will happen to you in this world, in your life, isn't necessarily good. Tell you what, divorce isn't good. Addiction isn't good. Abuse is not good. Illness and disease is not good. Depression isn't good. Watching a family implode isn't good. War isn't good. Poverty isn't good. Loneliness isn't good. But I'm thankful today that we serve a God who can make really good things out of really bad things. That we serve a God who works all things, come on somebody, for the good of those who love him. Now, when we read that, many times that's all we'll read, but that's not the end of the verse, there's more. Everybody say, there's more. Here's the more. For those who love him, go back to that, for those who love him, who have been, say this with me, called, say the word called, say it again, called, for those who love him and have been called to his purpose, that there is a calling of God on your life, that he's called you for a purpose. You say, what is that? Well, you keep reading down in verse 30, and it says this, and those he predestined, he, so he also called, there it is again, and those he called, uh, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Now, there's some really big theological words and concepts jammed together in that one little verse, and we're going to unpack and talk about that in the weeks to come, but I want to focus in on this one idea right now, that those he also called, that word called in, in the Greek is, is really kaleo, kaleo, kaleo means um, it means called, it means God is calling you. Uh, it, it's this idea that, that God is speaking to you. In fact, that word kaleo is used over 100 times in the New Testament. Over 100, 100 times. Uh, that where God is, is speaking to his people about this assignment, this calling, this purpose that he has for 
uh, our lives. And, and, and we see God really all throughout uh, Scripture calling people. He said, this is why you're here. This is why I've created you. In fact, the, the Latin word for called is called uh, vocare. This is where we get the word for um, voice. Or we also get the derivative from vocare, vocal, to be vocal. It, li- it also means calling. It means uh, calling. That's where we get the word uh, for vocation. Vocation. So kaleo and vocare in the Greek and in Latin both mean calling. Um, they both mean uh, uh, God speaking uh, his voice over your life. The problem with so many of us today is that from the root word vocari, where we get the word vocation, we have simply now turned vocation into what you do for a living, your job. But that's not what vocation, vocari, really means in scripture. But we want to equate what we do with God's calling in our life. And here's what I think we need to understand right from the very beginning, that your career, your vocation, is not necessarily your calling. Your career and your calling aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, Your job, where are you gonna go tomorrow morning and start your day and maybe punch a clock or show up in an office somewhere? Uh, your, Your job, your employment, while it's incredibly important, and your work, it really matters. It matters to God and it matters to this community. But your, your work, your vocation, your, what you do for a living is not as important as the calling that God has on your life. That your career isn't necessarily your calling. That, that your calling from God is much bigger than your career. Your calling is bigger, it's more significant, it's broader, it's larger, it's more encompassing than just your job. You see, you can make a living, your career makes a living, but your calling makes a life. And if we can't, yeah, yeah, give God praise, that's, that's important to understand. Because here's the deal, if you, if you can't differentiate between your calling and your gifting, you're gonna end up making a huge mistake. If you don't understand the difference between your gifting and your calling, one day you'll end up prostituting your calling for whoever is willing to pay you for your gifting. And when you study the Bible, And you just look at the big story of God, the arc narrative of God from cover to cover, Genesis all the way to Revelation. In the big story of God, you know what it really is? It's just God calling people to himself, calling people to follow him. The first man he made was Adam. God called him, take dominion, subdue the earth. God, he called Abraham to leave the land he was, to go to where he would lead him. God called Moses to be the great deliverer. God called David to be king. God called Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah and Hosea and and Joel uh, to speak on his behalf to the people as prophets. You flip your script into the New Testament, you just see Jesus time and time again, all through the Gospels, calling people to himself, calling people to his disciples, come, follow me. Matthew drops everything and he follows Jesus. Peter, he drops his nets, he follows Jesus because Jesus extended the invitation, the call. I've got, I know you were a fisher men, but uh, now I'm going to make you a fisher of men. What I'm going to, your calling is going to be different than your career, Peter. It's going to be broader. I'm going to use you in a significant and a special way. And, and here's my prayer. Here's my prayer for you. My prayer is the same prayer that that God, as he called a guy named Paul to follow him, who was an early terrorist and a mercenary of the early church, and he he called him to leave that life of terror, to leave that life of evil, and help instead join with him to build the kingdom of God on earth. 
And when he was talking to his church, Paul becomes a preacher and a church planner and a pastor. He, he prays this over his church family, and it's the same prayer I pray over you. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. I, want you, I pray that you would know Know the, the calling of God on your life and begin to walk in that calling because in that calling, come on somebody, there is hope. Come on, there is joy. There is significance. Uh, there is meaning and there is purpose. And that's my prayer, that God would open up the, the lie, uh, eyes of your heart, that the lights would come on and you would begin to understand this great calling that he has on you. In fact, if you want to just write something down, this would be great to write down. God has a calling on my life. That's truth. You need to write that down. You need to remember that. You need to think on that. You need to tuck that away. That God has a calling on my life. It says this in the book of Ephesians, re reiterating this this, the same kind of thread of which we're discovering together. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. See, God wants you to do good. He wants you to do good, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So while you were still being knit together in your mother's womb, the Bible says that God had a calling. He had an assignment, a plan on your life prepared in advance for you to do, and that it would be a good calling. I want you to know, gang, listen, God's got something good for you to do. He doesn't just brought you into this world to take up space and, you know, you know breathe in oxygen and go to work for 40 years and then clock out one day and move to Florida and sit by a pool and drink really, you know, fancy drinks with umbrellas in them. No, God has something more. Come on, he has something more for you to do with your life. Something significant and special, uh, hand-tailored just for you. Oh, may the eyes of your heart be opened to this truth. We are God's workmanship. We're created Here's the reality. We are created by God and for God. You are created by God and for God. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. You, 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 you are not here by happenstance. You are not the result of some kind of form of life that just somehow climbed out of some primordial ooze millions of years ago and then grew gills and then grew lungs. No, no, you were created as a man and as a woman by God and for God. And the sooner that that begins to settle in your soul, come on, the sooner you'll find hope, meaning, and significance in this life. You're not an accident. There are accidental parents, come on somebody, but there are no accidental children. He created you for him, for his purpose. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. And when we can begin to settle that soul, in our soul, that it's not about me, it's about what God wants to do in and through me, you will begin to move into a walk with God in the calling and he will do things in your life that you never dared dreamed or even thought were possible. He's a good, good God. You know, I remember when I figured this out, I was 21 years old, getting ready to graduate from college. I was gonna go to medical school taking the MCATs for some ungodly reason. I don't know why. It's, well, I wasn't really living a fully surrendered life at the time. Um, I wanted to be a forensic psychiatrist. Go figure that one out. I have no idea. Um, well, when you're not really walking with God full time, you make some really stupid decisions, amen? And so uh, I was going to med, med, getting ready to go to med school, and, um, and I took a job at a psychiatric institution and to kind of prepare. And... Um, I encountered a level of pain and suffering that I had never seen in my life. The people that came uh, to that hospital, the children, the women, uh, the, what they had been through, the abuse, um, the torment, 
It was just, there was a suffering and a, and a sadness and a pain. There was a darkness, there was a spiritual pain that I had never experienced before in my life. And it literally, it just wrecked me. Like literally, I had my own little episode where I kind of broke down. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even leave my apartment. It was a mess. I had to go through some therapy and, 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 and get some, some help. And I was a mess. I, I wasn't even in any condition to even go back to school. And so my dad says to me, why don't you take a semester off? He said, I'm going, my dad was a minister and he built churches all over the world, too, and um, loves to build things. And said, son, why don't you go to uh, South America with me? And uh, I said, sure. And so my dad takes me to South America, 14,000 feet up in the Andes Mountains, beautiful people. I'd never been out of the country before. My worldview was just so small. And when I got there, and after a, a week or two there, uh, God, he, he got a hold of my life once again. And I'll never forget sitting there on the side of the mountain under that big uh, full moon. Uh, God reconfirmed his call on my life that I sensed when I was only eight years old as a kid to become a preacher. And I've been running from that call. But it was in that moment when uh, God reconfirmed that call, I said yes to that call. I said, okay, God, I'll serve you whenever, wherever, how, all of me, I'm yours. And I'll, I'll never forget when I prayed that prayer. I said, God, man, I'll sign the check. I don't even know what this is going to cost me down the road. But I remember when I prayed that prayer, you know what happened? Absolutely nothing. That's what happened. <laughs> there was nothing. Squat. I mean, just nothing. There was no lightning bolt from heaven. I thought, you know, like an angel would appear and sing, like you could throw me a dove, a little, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. There was no dove, there was no voice, there was just me and a bucket of tears crying out to God, and there was no lightning, there was not, not, not one person, no stranger walks along the road and gives me this word, it was just me and it was God. But you know, that happened 25 years ago and it's never left me. Now listen, I've had a lot of jobs in between. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Go ahead, give God praise. Amen. <laughs> I've had a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs, you know, my life. Um, I delivered mattresses, going through seminary. I was uh, a waiter at the Olive Garden. <laughs> Dude, how many breadsticks can you people eat? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Good Lord. I, I um... I worked in a deli, I, uh, I did landscaping, I've painted houses. Those were my jobs, but I, from that moment 25 years ago, I've never walked away from my calling. And I just want you to know, it says, listen, we are God's workmanship created. You, listen, we're created by God and for God, for a purpose, and a, he's got a plan, a calling, an assignment for you. Matter of fact, it's so special that when he made you, unlike everything else that he made in all creation, it says he spoke it into existence. He spoke the heavens into existence. He spoke light into existence out of nothing, just at the, vo uh, the voice of God. Shafts of light, of bolting, come out of the sky and separate the light from the darkness. He spoke the world, the plants and the animals and everything in it, he spoke. But when he makes you and he makes me, the crowning act, the crescendo of his creation, he didn't speak us into his ex existence. It says he got down, and with his hands out of the dirt, he formed us. And as he formed us, he then, whew, he breathed life into us. I want you to know the, the breath that you have in your lungs was given to you by Almighty God. And he knew what he was doing when he gave you life, and he gave you a calling, and he gave you a purpose. You're made by him, and you are made for him. You are his workmanship. You know that word workmanship? It, the, the Greek word there is poema. Poema. Poema is where we get the word in English for poem. What the Holy Spirit who inspired Paul to write this is saying to you, that you are a poem of God. You're a work of art. You're one of a kind. 
You're a masterpiece. There's no Picasso. There's no Rembrandt. There's no Renoir that could ever light a candle next to you because you are the workmanship of God. You are a masterpiece created by the great divine creator who's created you for a purpose. And I know some of you are like, yeah, whatever, preacher. You can say that preacher talk for somebody else. I'm no masterpiece. I'm junk. No, you're not. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus didn't come and die on a cross for junk. He died for you, a masterpiece made, chiseled by the hands of almighty God. Hey, I get it. Some of us, we might have some rough edges. Come on, somebody, amen? Like, we're still a work under construction, right? And we, we got some of that uh, heavenly sandpaper out and a little chisel and chip some things away from us that, that need to be, but you're still a work of the hands of all God. God, listen, you're not junk. If you feel that way, you just don't understand the value that God has put into you. You say, how much does he value me? He values you enough to send his one and only son into the world that he might die for you and then rise again to give you life. For if he lives, we too shall surely live. Here's what, I write this down too if, if you're taking notes. My calling is also connected to my community. Real quick, we cannot fulfill the calling of God on our lives living in isolation. It's impossible. You just can't do it. You can't do what God's called you to do if you're not connected to other people. There is a, an interdependent connection between the calling of God and community. They, they, like hand and glove. You see, some faith systems teach that for you to reach the zenith of spirituality, you'll go on some high mountain and live by yourself in isolation. That's like the pinnacle of spirituality. But that's not what Christianity teaches. Christianity says the pinnacle of, of your spirituality is to get down into the mud and to get down into the, 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 the muck and the mire of life and love people who don't deserve to be loved and to serve people, come on, that need to be served and to lift other people up. That's what it really looks like to walk in your, your calling. And listen, um, your calling is intricately interconnected to your community. The Bible says it this way in the book of Hebrews 3, 1, brothers and sisters, come on, your family, brothers and sisters, you're a whole, you are holy, what is the word? Partners in a heavenly calling. We have to partner with one another to fulfill that calling. You know, I could stand up here and I could ask you, hey, if you've been around here for any length of time, maybe say the last 10 years, could you, could you list for me the top, you know, uh, 10 sermons you've ever heard me preach. Okay, let's say five. I only got five good ones. Okay, five good ones. Can you say, I'd ask you, can you name the title and could you tell me the text? And I, and I, I dare would say, nobody probably could do that. You've been sitting, listening to me talk for 10 years. But if I said this to you, could you tell me the five most influential people in your life that you're doing life and community with that have impacted who you are and made you the man or the woman of God that you are today, I bet you could talk to me for hours about those people. Here's why, because we're created for community. And, that's, and what community looks like here at our church is, we say it this way, that we love circles, that circles are better than rows. We get together on the weekends and we sit in rows and we sing, we stand, we sit, we listen to the word of God, we go home. And that's important. The early church did that. They met together in the temple courts in big crowds. And then they all went home. But during the week, it says, they broke to bread together with one another in their homes, and they had glad and sincere hearts. If all you do is show up here on the weekend, you're missing really the best part of our church. The best part of the church happens Monday through Saturday where we share our homes and our lives together. We break bread together. We have glad and sincere hearts. We have a circle of friends that we can call, that we can even text, and we can reach out to and say, hey, man, I got the job. 
Congratulations, let's have a party. Hey man, she said yes. All right, dude, I'm planning the bachelor party. Hey man, you know, I, I got the promotion and there's somebody there to throw a party and celebrate with you and to love you. Hey, we had the baby. Hey, and they, they show up at the hospital and they got balloons and they got, you know, cigars and they got like chocolate ones, I don't know, whatever you're into. Um, and they got, and they're there to celebrate with you and love you and know you. And they're also there when you don't get the job and you lose the job and you lose the baby, and you're struggling, and you don't know how to communicate anymore with your spouse, and your kids are going nuts, and you don't know what to do. You fall off the wagon. After maybe years of sobriety, there's somebody there for you to pick you up and to encourage you. Come on, in Christ, it's a circle of friends that are not gonna just judge you, they're gonna put an arm around you, and they're gonna lift you up and they're gonna speak life into you. See, we, we were created for that, and we all need that. And, and, and um, I just encourage you, maybe for some of you, your, uh, your move, your next step, could be to connect in one, of those, in one of those groups, and we'll tell you how to do that in just a few minutes. Uh, last of all, let me just say this, that God, he will empower me to move into my calling, to take that next step. That God would never just give you an assignment or a purpose and then not give you the power and the ability or the strength or the courage or the, the capital that you need to, to fulfill that. See, the, 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 the great thing of God is that when we sign up and we say, okay, God, I understand your calling in my life, all of a sudden what he begins to do is he begins to pour out his spirit on us. He fills us with his Holy Spirit the spirit of Christ, and he empowers us then to go and do what he called us to do because after all, it's his calling, it's not ours, amen? And, and, and I think this verse really kind of helps kind of punctuate this point. It says, for in him, for in who? In him, in Christ, in the spirit of Christ, living a spirit-filled life. It's in him that we live, not in us, our ideas, our strengths, our abilities, our talents, you know what we're good at? Our good looks, our ingenuity, our hard pull yourself up by your own two bootstraps work ethic. No, no, no. It's in him we live. It's in him that we live and we move and we have our being. So here's the deal. God takes all the pressure off. Says, look, you don't have to do it on your own. Aren't you thankful? Come on, we serve a God, come on, who's strong and powerful and he's gonna unleash all of the resources of heaven to help us do what he's called us to do. I, I think it, I, that kind of spirit-filled life, it kind of looks like this. If you would just indulge me for just a couple more minutes, that this sponge would represent your life. Everything about you, who you are, where you come from, your past, your success, your failures, your mistakes, your relationships, your family, your job, how you choose to spend your money, the entertainment choices that you make, everything about you is represented here. The calling of God on your life, what he's asked you to do, maybe even what suffering that you might have to endure. It's all represented here. And when that scripture says, in him, we live and we move, we have our being, it means we're not alone, but we immerse ourselves in the spirit of the living God. That we take our life and we make a decision to submerge and immerse it into the spirit of God. That in the kingdom of God, really the way up is, is the way down. And now that we immerse ourselves into the Holy Spirit, we live a spirit for life, now it's, you can't even separate the sponge from the water. The sponge is in the water, it's around the water, it's over the water, it's under the water. It's, 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 it's every, every little pore, every little crack, every little crevice, the water is touching everything. And that's the way it is with God and who we are. That when we live a life immersed in the Holy Spirit, God gets into 
every little crack and crevice of our life, every relationship we have, it's immersed in the Holy Spirit. Who we date, who we marry, how we parent our kids, every little thing, our attitude at work, it's all immersed in the Spirit of God. And now, you know, it's interesting. Has life ever squeezed anybody? Anybody ever get kind of squeezed in life, right? Like your kids are acting fool, like, you know, you just want to lash out and say, what's wrong with you, idiot? You know what I mean? Like some of you ever get life squeeze you? Like before you walk out of here, you're going to get in your car and you're going to drive out in the parking lot. Somebody's going to cut you off. All of a sudden, you know, life squeezes you and like you, you, like you want to you wanna join the, the uh, hearing impaired team here at our church. Like all of a sudden, you know sign language. Like you know, like all of a sudden... You're still on the church property, right? You're still, you're still. Let life ever squeeze you? You see, when you live a life fully immersed in the, in the spirit of the living God, we understand that it's not by might, and it's not by power, but it's by his spirit. Come on, in him we live and we move. Come on, we have our being. The Bible says... God, he, he fills us, he saturates our spirit with his spirit. And so that when we bump up against some things and we have some setbacks and we try to make decisions and life puts some pressure on us and it squeezes us, it says, here's whatever's on the inside, it's gonna come on the outside. And it's just a reflection of what you do on the outside, what's on the inside. And when the spirit is on the inside, the Bible says that the fruit of the spirit will become evidence that you're living a spirit-filled life. So when you get squeezed in life, you know what comes out of you? Love, joy, peace. Come on, patience, kindness, goodness, right. Come on, there's some righteousness in there. Come on, there's some, there's some, come on, when things get home, things get hard at home, come on, there's some faithfulness that squeezes out of you. When everything says to run and to leave, no, faithfulness says, no, you, you stay and you work it out. When that person hurts you, I mean, they harm you deeply. And instead of building a, 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 a story of revenge for that person who betrayed and hurt you, no, you squeeze a little harder and forgiveness comes out and long suffering, come on, and kindness and gentleness. You see, whatever's on the inside eventually comes on the outside. And I would just pray that you would make a move today to immerse yourself to the spirit of the living God who has a specific calling on your life and that you begin to move in that calling and that you would begin to find strength and hope and joy in the calling of God on your life it's your move let's pray Heavenly Father I thank you for your word today I thank you for your Holy Spirit that's evident and present in this room. I pray, God, that even in this closing moments that you would give us the courage to make a move. For some of us, the move today is to open up our heart and to invite you to come into our life. God, you would forgive us and make all things new, change us. And for some of us, it's to be filled with your Spirit today and to not dabble and play with the things of God, to get off the fence and pick a side to choose this day whom we would serve and to serve you with a whole heart. For some of us, that's our prayer. That God, you would help us to live in that, in that grace and in that calling. For some of us, it's a move to get into community and to not just show up here on the weekends, but God, to, to find a circle of friends that we would surround ourselves that are gonna lift us up and encourage us, give us sound, biblical, righteous, faithful advice. God, help us make a move into community today. We thank you, Father. We love you today. It's in your name we pray.